This is the legendary Fairchild 670 Compressor Limiter. Despite all the knobs, there's no ratio, no attack and no release. So how on earth do you use it? This video is sponsored by DistroKid. Follow the VIP link in the description down below to get 7% off an already amazing price to distribute your music to the world. You can currently buy a real Fairchild 670 on eBay for 350 thousand us dollars now granted that is a vintage version which has been used on famous recordings etc in fact you can buy a new one for a fraction of that cost at just 35 thousand us dollars now thankfully for the rest of us there are plugins from places like ik multimedia waves slate digital etc in this video i'm going to be using versions from universal audio because they most closely resemble the controls of the original hardware and in fact they've modeled the behavior of the circuit tree as well now when you first look at this compressor you may find the controls rather confusing let me help you with that. You're going to see two models of Fairchild. The 660 introduced in 1959 is a mono model and the 670 introduced soon afterwards is a stereo model. Now despite this, in the world of plugins, both of the models you can see here can be used on either mono or stereo sources. However, with the 670, you get a lot more control over the left and right channels separately. It's also worth noting that both of these models have a different character to them in terms of sound. So it's worth experimenting with both to see which one you like best. But for this video, we're going to be focusing on the 670. The 670 hardware has a total of 20 vacuum tubes and 14 transformers. Now with all of that in there, you're bound to make a difference to the tone. And that's why some people use the Fairchild as a tone box without applying any compression whatsoever. Now I've got it inserted into my master bus on this song at the moment. We're going to have a listen to a section of the chorus and I'm going to switch it off and on for you to hear the difference. Now, I must warn you up front, if you're listening to this on something like your phone speaker, you're probably not going to hear any difference whatsoever. So as usual, I would suggest you listen on some decent monitoring. Let's have a listen to this chorus. Oh. Now, for me, I could hear just a little bit of extra sort of energy in there, uh, a little bit more warmth in there as well. Now, if you couldn't hear what was happening, well, let's have a look and see what was happening. What I've done here is I'm going to switch on a spectrum analyzer here. And as you can see, I've got a 100 hertz sine wave playing through it. You can't hear it. That would be annoying. But that's what's playing through it. I've got the Fairchild switch off at the moment. Let's see what happens when we switch it on. And as you can see, there's a lot of harmonic distortion going on there. Now, admittedly, I am driving it pretty hard. The input level is pretty high. If we turn it down, you can see the character of the harmonic distortion changes, but there's definitely something going on there. And that's why some people use this as a tone box. Now, before we do any actual compression, let's go over the absolute basics. You saw me using this on off switch over here just a moment ago. And with this particular plugin, when we're in the off position, there's no processing happening whatsoever. So this can be a handy CPU saver if you need it temporarily. Now with the metering, we can use it in three different modes which are switchable with the switches beside the meters. In the first mode we're monitoring input levels. With the second mode we're monitoring gain reduction and with the third mode we're monitoring overall 
output. Now the most common mode that most of us will use is the gain reduction mode. This is going to show us when there's some actual activity happening in terms of compression. And what will happen is the needle will move over to the left as we can see here as some gain reduction is happening. Now we're going to talk about two of the most important controls on a Fairchild, the input gain and the threshold. The input gain, as its name suggests, is a control for the level of input. But importantly, this happens just before the input transformer. Now that's important because the more we drive the input gain here, the more likely it is that that transformer is going to create harmonic distortion as we saw with our spectrum analyzer earlier. Now keep that in mind. It's important later when we talk about the interplay between the input gain and the threshold. Now the threshold works very simply by turning to the right for more compression and to the left for less compression. Now in order to demonstrate the interplay between these two controls, I'm going to run an experiment. I'm going to set a target gain reduction of minus three decibels, and we're going to monitor that over here on the meters. So I'm going to start off by leaving the input gain where it is, and I'm gradually going to turn up the threshold until I achieve that minus three decibels of gain reduction. Oh. Okay, so I've roughly got that there. You can see the input gain is set to four, and also at the moment the threshold happens to be set to four as well. But of course, if I were to turn down the input gain like so, I'm going to have to push that threshold up higher for us to reach the same level of gain reduction. So I've done that now. Let's turn up the threshold to get that minus three dB again. Oh. Okay, so why is this significant? Well, in both cases, I was getting the same amount of gain reduction. So you might think, well, you could do it either way. However, we do get a slightly different result because if you remember, the harder we drive the input gain, the more harmonic distortion we are going to get. This is important. So if you want to retain a sort of a cleaner signal, if you like, with less distortion, then keep that input gain down low and push your threshold up high. Whereas if you want to add more character, then push the gain up and then use the threshold in a lower position to get the same amount of gain reduction. Now, if you've been using a Fairchild plugin or even the hardware for a while and you didn't know about this interplay between these two controls, let me know in the comments down below, hey? That encourages me. Now, before we look at another super important control on the Fairchild, I quickly want to point out a control which is specific to this plugin, and that's the headroom control. Now, this this changes the internal gain structure of the plugin, but in practical terms, it means that as you turn it more clockwise, you're going to get more gain reduction and more harmonic distortion. And the opposite is true if you turn it counterclockwise. Let's set it to a neutral position to begin with and have a look and listen to see what we've got. <gasps> So we're getting two to three decibels of gain reduction there. So I'm going to turn it fully clockwise now and have a look and listen now. So significantly more gain reduction, around about minus 15 decibels there, and we're getting more harmonic distortion. Now, an important thing to note, we're going to look at channel linking later, which means we can link the controls of the left and right channels. But with this particular control, it's always linked. Even though you've got two controls here, you can't unlink them. Now we move on to another super important control on a Fairchild. I mentioned in the intro that you won't find an attack or release control on this compressor. However, you do get some control over 
those things with the time constant control. And you can see this control has six different positions, which you can think of as six kind of presets. Now I'm going to go through each one and I'm going to make some practical suggestions for each one, but I want you to keep in mind they're just suggestions. You'll need to experiment with your own material. So starting off with position one, here we have an attack time of 200 microseconds, not milliseconds, microseconds, and a release time of 300 milliseconds. Now to put this into context, the famous 1176 compressor has a fastest attack time of 20 microseconds and a release time of 50 milliseconds. Much, much faster. So this one is relatively slow, but it was fast at the time at least. And this is the fastest setting for this particular compressor. Now this would be useful when you've got things with sharp transients like drums and percussion, maybe plucked instruments like guitar or plucked strings, and also for fast dynamic vocals, you might want to give this one a try. Now with position two, the attack time stays the same, 200 microseconds, but our release time is now 800 milliseconds. And you might use this for vocals, bass guitar, room mics and overheads, uh, take your pick, try it out. With position number three, we have an attack time now of 400 microseconds and a release time of two seconds. This is where we start to get into the realms of mixed bus compression. You might still try it on vocals if it's, say, a ballad. And also I would try this on acoustic guitar if I want it to stay relatively natural. Now with position four, our attack time goes up to 800 microseconds and our release is a full five seconds. It's a pretty long release time. We start to get into the realms of using this perhaps for mastering here. Again, mixed bus compression. And I might try it out on, say, backing vocals or pads where you've got these long sustains and you want to keep them intact and sort of sounding relatively natural. Now, with position five, things start to get a little bit different. Here, we go back down to our fastest attack time of 200 microseconds. But the release time is program dependent. Now, you'll hear this term quite a lot with compressors, and it simply means that the release time is going to depend on the material that the compressor is working with. So if, for example, in this position, um, it's dealing with transients, then it will have a two second release time. But if it detects multiple peaks, it'll have a 10 second release time, okay? But even that doesn't compare to position six. With position six, we have an attack time of 300 microseconds, but the release time is program dependent again. Now it's gonna be a 300 millisecond release time when it detects transients, 10 seconds for multiple peaks, and a whopping 25 seconds for consistently high level things. Now. In practical terms, well, you might still try this gently for vocals, for bass guitar, um, that might be another use for it, and really for things like broadcast mixes where you've got quite a lot of variation over a long period of time. So that would be the practical uses for that. Now, one of the problems with compressors is that low frequencies can sometimes cause the compressor to react much more aggressively than the higher frequencies. Have a listen and a look at the beginning of this this acoustic guitar performance and take note of how it's reacting to the bass frequencies. Now you saw particularly with that first bass note that it was doing you know over three decibels of gain reduction and for the rest of the material perhaps a decibel or less. Have another listen and listen to how sort of unnatural it sounds. You can actually hear the compression and you may not want that. So on this plugin, they've added a side chain filter and we can see the controls for it up here and we can filter out those low frequencies for the compression circuit. So this is for the side chain. We're not going to hear a difference in terms of we're still going to hear those low frequencies, but the compressor is not going to hear those low frequencies, so it's not going to react to them. So have a listen and a look at the difference now. I've got this set to around about sort of probably 350 hertz or so.
So we've got a little bit of light compression happening there still, but it's not reacting aggressively to those low frequencies. I've set up a really extreme example to demonstrate this next feature. What you're going to hear is the kick drum coming from the left side completely and the snare completely coming from the right side. Have a listen. Now there is some gain reduction happening here. You saw the needles move, but did you notice they're moving in unison with each other? Regardless of which channel exceeded the threshold, both channels were being compressed. And that's because I have the side chain link switched on. Now, if I switch this off or unlink the channels, we're only going to see compression on the channel where it went over the threshold. Have another listen and have a look. Now at the moment, this is happening for the left and right channels, but we will see later on with that other setting I keep talking about that there'll be a variation for this control later on. Now the other control we see next to, it, next to it in terms of link controls is the controls switch. And this is pretty straightforward. It just means that your left and right channels are linked. So if you have this on, when you move your threshold, left and right are gonna move in unison, or if you move your input, they're gonna move in unison as well. Now there are some variations to that which we will talk about again later when we talk about these very special other controls. <laughs> now on the face of it the output controls are rather simple. You can turn your final output of the plugin up or down but it's not exactly like that. But in order to explain how they actually work I first want to explain the mix control over here. Like many other plugins we are able to mix between the original signal all the way counterclockwise and then the compressed signal clockwise. Now what I want to do here is play you the original signal. It sounds like this. And then turn this mix to 100% so that we're only hearing the extremely and ludicrously compressed drums. Now this mix control gives us the opportunity for parallel compression on the fly. Now parallel compression is where you will compress the signal and then blend it in with the original signal. So I might start off with my uh, uncompressed drums and then gradually blend in those highly compressed ones. And this is where the output control comes in because if I use this mix control to only play the original signal, you'll see that the output controls make no difference to the original signal whatsoever. However, if I change this mix control to the compressed signal, then you'll hear the difference with the output controls being adjusted. So in other words, these output controls are not an output for the plugin as such, but they are an output level for the compression part of the plugin. Now, another important thing to notice about these output controls is that they are clean. In other words, they don't add any coloration. They don't make any difference to the harmonic distortion or anything like that. In a moment, we'll be looking at one of the most interesting features on this compressor. But before we do, I just want to remind you, if you're releasing music to places like Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, etc., don't forget to follow the VIP link in the description down below to our sponsor, DistroKid. If you follow that link, you'll get 7% off of your first year of membership. One really interesting aspect of a Fairchild is the AGC switch. Here we can switch from regular stereo processing to lateral vertical processing, or in other words, mid-side processing 
processing. Now, there's a historical reason why this is called lateral vertical, and it's to do with the fact that this was used as a limiter on vinyl productions. I'll let someone explain that further in the comments down below. Thank you so much for that. But for our purposes here today, we're switching between stereo processing and mid-side processing, where it says lateral vertical. Now, you'll notice the label here is in red, and you'll notice the other labels over here are in red. So when we're in this mode, this left metering becomes lateral metering, etc. Do note that there's no red writing on the input gain here, and that's because even though we're in this mode, these knobs are still for left and right input gain. Okay, so I've got it switched to lateral vertical mode. Let's just have a quick listen and look to what's going on here with my song. Was it the moment we shared? Was it the way that I dared to love? Now you probably noticed there that both the mid and the side processing had the same amount of gain reduction. And that's because just like when we were using left, right or stereo processing, we have this side chain link switched on. So regardless of whether the signal goes over the threshold in the mid or the side channels, both channels are going to get the same amount of compression, in other words. So what I'm going to do is switch this off now so that both channels get a different amount of compression. Let's have a listen and look to see what's happening now. Was it the moment we shared? Was it the way that I dared to So you may have noticed there in the mid channel, which is where the vocals are, it was responding really strongly to those vocals and there was hardly any compression happening at the sides. So let's play with this a little bit. But what I'm going to do first is unlink the other controls. So I'll go down here and unlink the controls so that I can, for example, turn off compression for the middle and then turn it really up pretty extreme for the sides. And we'll get a completely opposite result now. Have a look and a listen. Was it the moment we shared? Was it the way that I dared? So this is really keeping the vocals very, very sort of present and upfront in this mix when we're using it in this mode. So a very, very useful mode indeed. Definitely experiment with it. Now I mentioned in the intro that we have no ratio control with this compressor, but we do have a kind of an indirect effect on ratio by using the DC threshold control. Now, as we adjust this counterclockwise, a couple of things actually happen. First of all, our knee gets harder and the threshold itself is lowered. Now, what do I mean by a hard knee? Well, simply a hard knee means once you cross the threshold, then the ratio is applied fully at that point for gain reduction. However, with a soft knee, the ratio is applied sort of gradually, both before the threshold and after the threshold, ramping up, if you like, to the full amount of gain reduction. Now, you can see the difference in the two extremes with this control in the graph that we can see on the screen at the moment. Now, the net effect of this is also that ratio is kind of affected indirectly, if you like, but we're just not getting sort of direct control over it. Now on this particular plugin, we have two presets with this control and you can see the labels for them here. You just simply click on the label to choose that preset. The first one, Cal, is basically the default calibration for a Fairchild compressor. But the second one, OWR, is a preset relating to the recording studio with the Fairchild that they base this plugin on. That's the Ocean Way Recording Studio, and that's why the label here is OWR. And I'll put a graph up on the screen now to show the difference between these two presets. What's been the biggest sort of light bulb moment for you in this video? Let me know about that in the comments down below. And thank you so much for joining me today. Today. My name is Mike. I hope you're well and I'll see you in the next video.